All right, we are on the couch with Morgan Gray, who's creative director of the Bureau XCOM Declassified. How are you doing? Good, Adam, how's it going, man? Doing all right. Now, we, we saw this game quite extensively at E3, but you brought a, another section of game. It sounds like it's it's later on yep. in the Bureau, and yeah. we're gonna sort of see a little bit more of how the strategy plays in. Exactly, we're, we're taking a, a, a jump forward in the timeline a little later in the progression of the campaign. Uh, Cardinal's agents got new technology, the enemy threat's scaling up, and so there's new things to show off. Well, let's, let's go ahead and get into it. Now, when, when you say that new technology has been acquired, is that through just, just the course of playing it, or is it through upgrades, through research? So there's, uh, it comes in different flavors. During the course of just playing, like Carner's team will, as they defeat certain enemies, will gain access to the technology that those enemies have. So we'll move away from bullets, and we'll get into laser rifles and the plasma weaponry right here. I think Carter is, uh, is equipped with uh, the fruits of that labor. Also, throughout the game world, you'll find different schematics for these backpacks, which effectively allow you to treat them like EQ, in which you'll equip them onto Carter and his agents and be able to upgrade various aspects. Like, you can be a guy that like, takes out shields better, or removes armor, or, you know, does 2x damage, that sort of thing. And so that is a level of customization. What we wanted to do was sort of abstract the I manufacture, I research aspects of the, the sort of strategic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, classic XCOM formula and, and bring it into more into our focus, which was being the squad leader on the battlefield versus being the guy building the, you know, all of the base and that apparatus. Our, our fantasy, as, as we've talked about before, is what's it like to be that battlefield commander having to do orders and tactics in real time when the threat is up close and personal. Now, with, 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 with that in mind and thinking about the, the, the old XCOM, I mean, will every player sort of have the same equipment at their disposal at, at, at the same point in the game, or? Yeah, at, at a high level, like as you see we go into this combat, like what they'll have at their disposal is access to the same equipment. We have no idea what they're going to take. So here our, our, our player right now, our driver, has customized out these two different agents that are with him, uh, bringing up, I believe, as a, a commando agent and a recon agent. There's four classes, commando, recon, engineer, and support. As those, they take these agents in the field, they acquire experience points, at which point they begin to rank up and more customization starts to come into play. Which sort of powers do they select? Which level up paths do they go down? So there's a lot of options for the player. We kind of call it a gameplay toolbox, a tool mm -hmm. chest. And we leave it up to the players to decide what to bring into the battlefield and how to deploy it. Now, obviously, uh, you can you know, play in real time with Carter. But there's, all, there's the option, I would say the requirement, to stop down and issue commands. I'm, I'm just curious, the gentleman who's playing here right now, is his skill level at the point that he's able to go real time longer than most players can? Uh, I think he comes, it goes in and out. I think you'll find, uh, even for, for guys like myself who've played quite a lot of this game, it really depends on the engagement and the array of the forces left, where you happen to be at a moment in time about when it's better for you to, to slow things down, catch your breath, think to a degree, or try it in real time. It's great that you say that the, the sort of option versus the necessity. It is actually a necessity. I mean, the, the fantasy we're trying to fulfill here is that sort of battlefield commander. We often refer to it as combat quarterback sometimes. So battle focus, the interface that allows you tactical control of your squad mates, is in certain regards sort of a bit of like the huddle. Uh, mm -hmm. They use a football analogy. And then you do have a host of quick commands at your disposal, like go here, target this guy back on me, which give you audibles. Going in and out of the real-time shooting, quick audible calls, and then battle focus, is sort of that loop is the heart of what we're trying to offer up here. It's a, actually a grand experiment. Like get the core of that turn-based isometric XCOM experience, but give you real-time control. And different players will, you know, go in and out of all those systems in varying degrees, fight to fight to fight, really. And of course, you've made the decision not to go with a hard pause when you go into that wheel, that you know there is still some motion going on. What was the decision behind that? Well, I mean, taking the analogy of combat quarterback even further, what we didn't want to lose was that, that sensation of under duress. I mean, the, the whole genesis, this grand experiment of try to find a real-time expression of the, you know, the core tactics of XCOM, sort of went out the window when we froze time. Like, you could run out in the middle of the battlefield, freeze, think to your heart's content, then come up with a plan. And for us, it's like, no, you have to do this under duress. So by just adding that little bit of time is moving on, it stops you from doing things like, I'm gonna run out in the middle you know, of the battlefield, hit the interface and make a plan, or I'm gonna ignore this giant muton coming at me because I have all the time in the world. We wanted to keep the tempo up and the pressure up. Uh, we actually experimented. We had it frozen before, and we went. You know, this is this is still uh, this is training wheels, and we wanted to take the training wheels off the experience. Now, also, it, it would seem that it requires you to want to hold back a little bit more. 
you know, the, the closer you are to an enemy, and while they're still, you know, in motion, albeit slowly, they can still get you. You know, you, uh, yeah. you, 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 you want to have some wiggle room there. Yeah, I mean, the battlefield management is, is a huge aspect. Like, with the emphasis on tactics, like, really trying to remove the, the Rambo aspects, which were just not core to the franchise, sort of necessitate that the smart commanders in the field are both thinking about what they've brought to the table in terms of their weapons and, their, and the agent classes that they've, they've decided to bring on this operation, where, what kind of enemies and where they're arrayed, and then using the actual battlefield itself as a piece of that puzzle. Like, what advantages do I have? Do I have a height advantage over there? Should I get my guys over here and get a crossfire? How do I flank? You know, these sort of decisions on the fly. We wanted to make the battlefields feel less generic and also a little more of, of tools at your disposal. In fact, some of the engagements are crafted not to be explicit, to require certain actions, but to really imply the smart tactical thing would be to do over here, but we, we still leave it up to you. Having the player put all that together is sort of the heart of the, the gameplay loop we were trying to achieve. Um, now, what, what happens in, in, in games of this type, and I think even in, in Enemy Unknown, the players tend to have, you know, they, they, they get very comfortable with a certain set of characters or loadout and they tend to lean on that. Is, I mean, is this game designed where you're going to have to re re rethink that and try to do things that, that are new and different? Well, certainly, like, everyone's going to fall in love with their favorites, right? They'll have a specific, you know, class of agent or maybe even a specific agent that's customized. Uh, because our game features uh, the very XCOM pillar of permadeath, uh, it's possible for one of your agents in the field of battle to get dropped. In fact, we might see this today because the game could be quite difficult. Uh, it's sort of, it behooves you to, you know, to level up more of your bench as it were. You want to have uh, various types of agents at your disposal because certain situations are going to be kind of hairy depending on what you bring. And you're going to want to have some guys that have a decent amount of experience to bring to the table so if someone does die and they're gone for good, you're not bringing in a newbie in at the later part of the game. Yeah. So there's a bit of bench management, almost like a sports team. Everyone needs to play. you got to keep people hot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is weird, right? You don't think about like combat as, as a sports analogy, but you know, the more we started to investigate it, the more we played and we are looking for touchstones outside of just classic XCOM, it really came to the table. Like what, what other sorts of environments is it built on the skill of a small number of individuals working in cohesion against an equally good, if not better good, adversary really comes to sports a lot of the time. Uh, okay, that's a really big mutant. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, Joe, our, our driver, he's been doing good, you know, small unit tactics, opening up flank lanes, doing a lot of support. He's now enraged uh, the enemy threat, bringing in, uh, you know, basically a, a super mutant, effectively, a mutant with a jump pack. How do you how do you make a mutant even more scary? Give him a jump pack. And now he's going to actually try to spread out his forces a little more to, to deal with this threat. When mutant gets close, it's pretty much, he's going to knock you dead. So you can see he's moved one flank over, created a diversion, basically a hollow agent that's going to form as a distraction. He's moving his agent on the far right flank. Whoa! He is <laughs> barely avoiding the super slam from the mutant. Uh, I, this might be a chance for permadeath, we'll find out. But now, yeah. I, I, the, the one, one thing I'm noting is the range with which she can order his squad mates to move is quite wide. Is that something that increases over time through the course of the game? It's it's pretty much fixed from, from the get-go. Like, we didn't want to solely piecemeal out the, the tactics. Our methodology has always been, like, it is going to be a good sort of shock to the system and require a bit of uh, an evolution of thought for most people coming from a third-person framework into our more, you know, tactical game just to think in tactics. So we didn't want to limit the tactical ability. What we do give over time is access to new powers and abilities. Mm -hmm. so we give you more options, but the core tenants, the you can order to this range and guys will come back here. We wanted to give you a stable platform so that you can make a lot of good informed decisions about your, your strategy, the plan that you're building. But, but kind of with, with the reference to Enemy Unknown, it seems that they can move in, in far more vastly than, than they could in that game. Yeah, we really, we, we move oh, you far uh, and wide. In this case, the advantages that Joe was able to get by taking that far, far, I guess, right flank at time that the order was initiated and moving it, you know, his guys on here, he was able to get a good combined fire and avoid pretty much getting uh, ground pounded other than that first one, which was the, the hello ground pound. Which was quite terrifying. Yeah. Might so you have Mr. Stewart here, our agent, about to bleed out. So we have William Carter, our lead character, getting him off the ground. The cool thing is, agents will, you know, they'll revive each other. They'll revive you. And there's a high degree of autonomy that we've given the agents as well. We've tried to take the stance that your agents on their own are generally pretty good. They're smart, but it's your orders, your direction that makes them a team, and it's that, that team tactic that is going to be required to have success throughout the campaign. I mean, on a normal setting, going up in the difficulty, I mean, can you really just let your AI automate? 
played? I mean, is that is that even a viable way to play the it game? Is, it is viable for some degrees on the lowest setting, the rookie setting. Yeah, okay, you can, you can get some You can get some progress, but you won't make it very far in the game even on that setting. Our hope, actually, is even on the more difficult settings, the really smart commander will be able to just sort of post up, get their lemonade out, chill out, uh, you know, at a cover, and just through how good their orders and tactics are, they can just utilize their agents alone to win a good majority of the fights. But we try to make sure that the recipe never becomes rinse and repeat, so we throw enough challenges to, you know, vary up the tactics required and keep you know keep you on your toes keep you honest no there are varying degrees of success within a level like those sleepwalkers we saw though those humans that yep. seem to be affected by the aliens um, I mean, can they die? Does that affect sort of how your outcome is going to be? So the, the levels themselves have a pretty straightforward success criteria for the primary objectives. There are secondary objectives within, within okay. the level that will influence basically acquisition for further equipment or experience points. The sleepwalkers themselves actually form a, a narrative point for the most of the, you know, for a good majority of the game, which is the impact on the population of America. I mean, here we are in 62 America invaded by aliens. We didn't want it just to not sort of deal with what does that mean to the population? So the spread of that virus, that disease, its impact on the U.S. and its impact on XCOM and XCOM operatives that you're going to get familiar with is a narrative thread that we leave up to you to sort of resolve and interact with throughout the course of the game. And here come the big boys. Okay, so this is a, a dropship. <laughs> yeah, the dropship is a great, he's sort of a, a mini boss in of himself, he brings in new enemies. And you know, pushing on that tactics, he's a great combined arm sort of enemy. He provides air cover to the bad guys on the field. He's going to get support from these drones in the air that are going to be casting shields and heals on them. And we're trying to get the player to do a you know target prioritization, which is you know at the heart of XCOM. What is the biggest threat now? What right. should I be dealing with now versus just have you know hit point sponges everywhere? And so we're at, we're smartly and a little bit pre-predictively, I would say, because we know how this level is going to go. You had a feeling this might be coming. <laughs> yeah, we we, said, we we've walked up into enough ambushes. It's not every now and then you need to ambush the enemy. So with that fire mission, he's basically dropping artillery strike on their drop zone. But they were smart enough to a few of them to run to safety. So we didn't quite just one and done all of them. But again, Joe is really working the, I'm gonna do two flanks. This, the, the disadvantage of this kind of strategy though is if something were to go wrong for any one of those agents. You have an isolated yeah. teammate. Yeah, it is a long haul to get over them to get them off the ground and you have to put yourself at a lot of risk when you do it. So there's advantages and disadvantages for whatever you do and you know, good players will sort of learn how to cope with whatever pops up. So, so what is the priority right now? I mean, it looks like that you, know, you guys aren't, aren't ignoring the gunship, but you have quite a few enemies on the ground. Exactly, I mean, I, the irony, even though the gunship is a bit Big enemy, and he's gonna, you know, he can really shoot you fast. The the biggest priority is the lowly little drones out there, uh, because of their ability to heal. You could chop wood against this gunship all the time, but if those drones exist, they're just gonna heal him up, and you'll run out of ammo and whittle down. So in this case, you can see right there, it was shooting a heal beam to his friend. Taking these guys out is the best strategy, which will open up the door to take out the gunship. Uh, you know, leaving, I believe, the only thing to worry about left Ooh. is one lone sniper. Looks like that gunship went down. Good job, good job. So Joe took out the drones, gave his agent a chance to get the kill shot after whittling, and now they just have one last Zujari sniper in the background with a taunt ability, which is basically pull aggro. Mm -hmm. Pulls him off a of cover, sets him out in the open to get shot, and it looks like Joe's gonna do a great job of cleanup here why he hides behind a little window snippet. <laughs> <laughs> Which just goes to show, even when you think you have the whole advantage, you know, even familiar players are like, oh, I'm not trusting it. I'm gonna be I mean, super safe, super tactical. Is, is, is this set up, I, th I think, you know, you, you, you look at, you know, good strategy games that, you know, you can feel that you're really, really, okay, th I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna make it, but then right. suddenly you can have that one really beneficial sort of change of fortune. Yep. And then it, it, it changed. I'm, I'm trying to say like, are you trying to keep the player from reloading once things go bad? I mean, it's our hope. We can't control what someone does on their couch. I mean, obviously, someone right. has an investment, they're gonna reload. But we do try to keep it to go that, look, any one setback isn't, isn't the end of the game. And it's still worth your while and in personal time and investment to just keep going forward. I mean, I think what we saw even with, uh, with in Frax's Excellent Enemy Unknown is, although it was cool to have the thought of permadeath, a lot of people still reloaded the check. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. just that moment of, I don't know. I, I don't, don't know. know, what do I do? What, what is my time worth to me? Well, with, 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 with that in mind, I mean, can the game end for you ahead of its narrative ending, as, as, as it could in you, Enemy Unknown? It, in theory, you can hit a wall where you've actually mm -hmm. lost so many guys and are lack the ability to have the, the weight, the force behind you to take it to the end and, and conclude it because you know, you've lost, you have nothing but rookies and you're not powerful enough to beat the game. You can have a soft ending that way. It also ends obviously on death, but there is no sort of time has run out 
right. uh, you know, like we're not doing a clock on you because mostly because it just doesn't feel like it fits our game paradigm to run the clock. And it's for the player to kind of realize that they are putting themselves in that kind of tight situation that they can't get themselves out of. Exactly. Well, um, I have to say, I, every time I see this game, I get more and more intrigued, and it definitely, it may look like a shooter, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting the thinky part. It's becoming <laughs> abundantly evident. Yeah, I mean, our, our hope is that we, we're making, you know, brain, brainy shooters for brainy, brainy shooters. <laughs> <laughs> so I, hopefully people can see that, you know, it is, even though it looks on first blush on a screenshot or a vidcap, sort of a third person cover game, that really it is like small unit, squad on squad, tactical combat, where we're just replacing you know, uh, you know, Delta Force and Spetsnats with XCOM and enemy aliens. I was, I was just about to make that analogy myself. Okay, it comes out on um, August 20th. August 20th. Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. Absolutely. All right, Morgan, thank you so much for your time. Adam, thank you so much.